Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky, sponsored by Squarespace. And it is August 2022, and I'm sure those of you in the Northern Hemisphere at the mid to high latitudes are very much welcoming the return of dark skies after living with the summer twilight for the past couple of months. Coming up this month, we have the last supermoon of the year. We also have one of the best meteor showers of the year, normally in the Perseids meteor shower. It's a real nice gathering of Mars and the Pleiades. A gorgeous opportunity to capture a crescent moon and Venus in the morning skies. And of course, there's plenty of Milky Way action to be had. But guys, did I tell you my book, Photographing the Night Sky, is now available for pre-order? I'm not sure if I told you or not. It is the Encyclopedic Guide to Landscape Astrophotography. It's 570 pages of information as dense as a black hole and I can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it. It's gonna be printed in mid-August, and all of the pre-orders up until then will be signed by myself. There's some limited edition hardbacks remaining. I hope they're still remaining by the time this video goes live because they will sell out very soon. And you can purchase the book from my website, annawallisphotography.com, which is hosted by the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the place to host your website or online store. You can use it to host galleries of your uncompressed images. You can use it to write a blog and post interesting articles. And like me, you can use it as an online shop to sell digital products like my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets and physical products like my book and soon the 2023 calendar. If you'd like to give Squarespace a try, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Alan. Start with one of their award-winning templates and then when you're happy with your website and you want it to go live, use the code Alan at the checkout for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name with Squarespace. So starting in the Northern Hemisphere where as darkness falls, the Milky Way core is already in the South and as the night goes on, it crosses into the Southwest and sets in the early hours of the morning. Those of you that have been stuck with twilight for the past two months, you might want to make the most of your chance with the Milky Way core in dark skies whilst you can. And if you were to follow the Milky Way band up to the zenith, the point of night sky directly above you, you'll find the Cygnus region of the Milky Way, real beautiful, fuzzy region of the Milky Way and because it's overhead it's a really good time to get a star tracker out and focus on some of the amazing nebulae in this area of the sky so the North American nebula is a really good example. If we continue to follow the Milky Way band into the northeast we have a very beautiful region of the night sky. It's not the brightest part of the Milky Way but you've got the Cassiopeia constellation here which you can recognize from the W asterism and when you're capturing this region of the night sky, there's lots of lovely bright stars. You also get Andromeda, the spiral galaxy, which will show up in your wide angle images. It's a region of the night sky that I recently photographed in a vlog, the Mono Lake vlog that I shared just last week. So go and check that out if you haven't already. Swing in a little bit to the northwest and you'll see that Ursa Major now is in what most people would call its upright position. So the bear is actually standing upright and it's skirting across the northern horizon as the night goes on. So it's a really great opportunity to capture it with some landscape foreground. And again, I did that in my recent vlog at Mono Lake in California, so do check that out. As for the planets, you'll spot Mercury in the west just after sunset and quite difficult to spot. It's probably at its highest above the horizon in the middle of the month and then it reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 27th where it'll be its furthest from the sun in the sky. Now if we follow the yellow line here which is the ecliptic, the path that the sun, the planets and the moon follow in the night sky, we will see Saturn starting the night in the southeast and as the night goes on that will arch across the southern skies chasing the milky way across the sky just to the left of that we will eventually see jupiter rising this is the moon rising on the 13th and there finally is jupiter rising in the east at about half past 10 local time if i fast forward time just a little bit we will see eventually so Uranus rising about midnight and then we have Mars as well. So Mars, the red planet. And this month, right next to the very blue open star cluster Pleiades, 
and uh, the California Nebula there, which you'll pick up with an Astro modified camera. But this is a real nice opportunity. You get a nice color contrast between the red, orange Mars and the blue color of Pleiades. And I forgot to mention, but Saturn is actually in opposition this month. It's directly opposite the sun for us on Earth, and it will be shining at its brightest for the year. And then if we fast forward time a little bit as we approach the morning twilight, we will eventually see the likes of Orion and the winter constellations returning to the night sky. So that's exciting. And there is Venus shining nice and bright, rising into the morning skies before the sun. But as the month goes by, Venus will rapidly approach the sun. And uh, by the end of the month, you will no longer be able to see Venus, but it will return next month as a morning star. On to the southern hemisphere where as darkness falls, the Milky Way core is already very high in the eastern skies. And that leaves the great rift of the Milky Way standing very much vertically on the northeastern horizon. And then you've got a little bit of the Cygnus region there, and that will become more and more visible as it climbs into the north. But swinging around, following the Milky Way band to the other side of the horizon in the southwest, real stunning region of the Milky Way. You've got the Vela constellation with the giant Gum Nebula. You've got the Carina Nebula, the jewel of the southern night sky, and very recently photographed by the James Webb Space Telescope. And then, of course, you've got the Crux constellation, which is right next to the dark, eerie Coal Sack Nebula as well. The large and small Magellanic Clouds start the evening and spend most of the evening very low on the southern horizon, but they will climb into the southeast as the night goes on. Coming back to the Milky Way core, which passes pretty much directly overhead from the east and uh, down into the west. So I'm just going to fast forward time just a little bit. As you can see, the Milky Way core now sinking into the west. And then after midnight, you've got a real nice opportunity here for a Milky Way arch panorama. Got the Cygnus region here, through to Aquila, the, the Great Rift, the Dark Rift, the core, the Norma region, all the way down to Crux and Carina. Just absolutely stunning. And of course, just to the left, you've got the large and small Magellanic Clouds. And as the night progresses, it sinks down and down and down to the western horizon until around about 4 a.m. the Milky Way very much parallel to the horizon. So down in the southern hemisphere, at these latitudes, and very much having the horizon aligned with the galactic plane. And that means if we swing over to the east now, You've got the southern summer constellations, like Orion and Taurus now rising into the eastern skies. As for the planets, so Mercury in the western evening skies chasing the sun below the horizon. Mercury obviously a lot easier to see from the southern hemisphere because the ecliptic is so steep against the horizon so mercury best viewed around the middle of the month and then it reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 27th which will be better for those in the southern hemisphere following the ecliptic the path that all the planets follow into the east saturn rising pretty much after darkness falls because of course it is at opposition this month so it's directly opposite the sun so that spends pretty much all night in the night sky and it's shining at its brightest for the year and i'm just going to speed up time a little bit you see neptune rising there followed by jupiter around 11 pm local time and i'm just going to fast forward time a little bit more and then you see mars rising around about 3 a.m local time right next to pleiades the very blue open star cluster and uh, you got Hyades here from Taurus, another star cluster. So, real nice photographic opportunity. And as we approach the pre-dawn hours, we will eventually see Venus rising after all of the southern summer constellations have cleared the horizon. 
uh, there is in the morning twilight shining nice and bright but venus does get closer and closer to the sun as the month goes on and it will return as a morning star next month as for conjunctions and close approaches this month, on the 11th into the 12th, a full moon will annoyingly be right next to Saturn, and I'll explain why that's annoying very shortly. A few days later, on the 15th, the gibbous moon will be next to Jupiter, and then on the 19th and the 20th, there's a pretty neat opportunity to photograph the moon along with Mars and Pleiades, so really interesting opportunity there. And as always, my favourite conjunction, a crescent moon and Venus can be spotted together on the 25th in the morning skies. There's something so delicate and beautiful about this sight. Full moon this month is unfortunately on the 12th. Again, I'll explain why that's unfortunate shortly. But this full moon is known as the sturgeon moon to the Native American tribes because the giant sturgeon fish of the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain were most readily caught during this part of summer. And it is also the last supermoon of the year. So the moon will appear a little larger and a little brighter than normal. But not to worry because, of course, every full moon is a stunning spectacle that should be enjoyed. Now, as for the special events this month, August brings one of the best meteor showers of the year in the Perseid meteor shower, which peaks around somewhere between the 11th and the 13th, where you can expect to see sometimes up to 100 meteors per hour from a dark sky location. But unfortunately this year on the 12th, there is a full moon right on the peak and that's going to wash out all of the fainter meteors. However, Perseids are known for being bright, pretty slow burning, and a lot of them leave persistent trains where there's a bit of colour left, a streak of colour in the wake of the meteor for one to several seconds. So you will certainly still see some meteors, but unfortunately a lot of the fainter ones are going to be washed out by the moonlight. Me personally, I'm looking forward to capturing some meteors on film, because having a full moon out at night makes the footage look nice and clean. And as I said, a lot of the bright Perseids will definitely shine through the moonlight. Now, the Perseids is very much a northern hemisphere affair, but for those of you that live in low latitudes of the southern hemisphere, you'd be wise to face north in the pre-dawn hours. The radiant of the meteor shower is within the constellation Perseus, which for those in the northern hemisphere, rises in the northeast in the late evening and continues to climb higher and higher into the sky as we approach sunrise. And so because the radiant point is getting higher and higher and higher as the night goes on, the Perseus is one of those classic meteor showers that has higher rates of meteors in the pre-dawn hours when the radiant point is nice and high in the sky. But remember, you don't have to look in the direction of the radiant point to see meteors like the mainstream media would have you believe. Meteors will fall all over the sky, as you can see in this incredible image by Peter Horalek. It's just that if you follow a path backwards from where the meteor came, they all intersect at a point in the night sky called the Radian Point, and that point is within the constellation Perseus, hence the name the Perseid Meteor Shower. Now, lastly, even though the peak is hindered by the full moon, the Perseids is a long meteor shower. It's active from around right about July the 24th all the way through to August the 24th, and so you might have some luck at the start of the month when we have darkest skies. The rates are not going to be high as the meteor shower, but at least there's no moon interfering. So in general, just keep an eye out all month for Perseids because you'll definitely see some. And for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, so on the night of the 30th into the 1st, we have the peak of the Southern Delta Aquarids meteor shower. That has its radiant point in the constellation Aquarius. And so it's much more beneficial to be in the southern hemisphere. Now, it's a much lesser meteor shower than the Perseids with only a maximum of 20 meteors per hour. But with the moon out of the way, it might be a better display, and especially for those of you in the southern hemisphere. And there are also several other minor meteor showers that are active. It's quite beneficial to the southern hemisphere as well. I mean, I won't go into detail about those because they are very minor meteor showers. But just know that there are several minor meteor showers active as well as the Perseids and the Delta Aquarids, so there's a good chance of spotting some meteors whilst you're out this month. So keep your eyes on the skies. And that's basically all I have for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. 
For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload your images to social media using the hashtag Wittens, and I pick my favorite three for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a Constellation hoodie designed by myself. And first place wins a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky. Last month's theme was Noctilus and Clouds, and I said I'd give a consolation prize to the best Milky Way photo as well, because not everybody has access to see Noctilus and Clouds. But this month, I'm feeling generous. In third place, there are three people. I mean, some of these images were so awesome, I just couldn't choose. So the first third place person is Gwen Blank with this stunning image of Noctilus and Clouds above a place called Saint Cloud, would you believe it? Another third place winner is Tyler Collins with this very beautiful image of a tractor underneath some Noctilus and Clouds. And I found this image quite interesting because there's links between Noctilus and Clouds and climate change and of course things like the exhaust fumes of vehicles and rockets and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was an interesting uh, contrast there between potentially something that's contributing to the increased sightings of Noctilus and clouds in recent years. And then the other third place winner was Ricarda Sandriuska in Lithuania with this beautiful misty morning and uh, just getting a little selfie there with the Noctilus and clouds. I thought that was really stunning. In second place was this person, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, I am sorry, but just a very picturesque scene in the Netherlands. I mean, you would know instantly this was taken in the Netherlands if it wasn't geotagged. You've got very cute stone building there, a canal with a bridge and a windmill. I mean, the only thing that's missing is a tulip, but there's probably some in that field there on the left, I'm sure. <laughs> But I love the colours in this, the gorgeous yellows of the uh, the light in there and the buildings illuminated. And then the silver blue of the Noctilus and clouds in the sky, stunning reflections. I just absolutely love this image, so nicely done. And in first place was this image from Tony in Whitby, a time slice captured from sunset to sunrise. This is truly spectacular work. So you've got on the left hand side there, you've got sunset and then each slice of the image is forward in time a little bit. So you've got sunset, the twilight after sunset in the middle, you've got the Noctilus and clouds which came out at night. And then as we get to the right of the image, we have the morning twilight and the sun rise. I thought this was absolutely incredible. So well done to Tony. And last but not least, there was a Milky Way Constellation Prize, and that goes to Dani Munoz in Cantabria, Spain, with this absolutely beautiful image of the Milky Way above some rolling hills and valleys. I just thought this was really, really beautiful. So congrats to Danny. He won a copy of my book, Photographing the Night Sky. Next month, okay, let's just do it for everyone. Let's just do the Milky Way core. There were so many entries this month. I'm sure there's going to be loads next month for me to choose from, so I'll have fun digging through all of those. And that's it, guys. Let me know what event you are most looking forward to this month by getting in the comments down below and starting the conversation. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.